Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to our distinguished lecture series today. Um, this is MAA launching our virtual distinguished lecture series and we're happy to have you with us. Uh, my name is Kiera Edwards and I'm the Director of Programs and Management at MAA. Deirdre? Well, hi everyone, I'm Deirdre Longacre Smeltzer. I'm Senior Director for Programs at the MAA and I want to welcome everyone as well. Um, we will start with the presentation itself in just a minute. But meanwhile, if you are joining us on either Facebook or YouTube, uh, welcome. The, the chat should be active on both platforms um, throughout the event. So um, if you'd like to, I invite you to drop into the chat where you're tuning in from. Um, I'm joining you from Harrisonburg, Virginia. In fact, I think that uh, each of the people that you'll see on screen tonight is coming from a different location. So <clears throat> that's one of the um, that's one of the uh, wonderful things about going virtual with our distinguished lecture series is that people can join us from anywhere around the globe. Yeah. Um, this is our this is our third virtual distinguished lecture, and so far I think we've engaged with around uh, three thousand viewers of the first two presentations by Pamela Harris and Alexander Diaz Lopez which needless to say is far more than we could engage when we were doing these presentations um, in person in the in the carriage house so uh, thank you to those of you who uh, joined us for those uh, first two distinguished lectures and um, if you missed them or if you saw them but you want to rewatch, you can you can go back and find those on youtube or facebook so tonight we have another great presenter lined up, um, Nathan Carter, who is going to be sharing with us about mathematics in data science. That's wonderful. Really excited. I'm really excited about all the work that MAA is doing around data science lately. Um, for anyone who is interested, I also want to mention that in June this year, we'll be doing a data science workshop sponsored by MAA's PicMath program. So that workshop is going to be um, June 21st through 24th at uh, Brigham Young University. And it's going to be for any um, faculty, actually, um, who it'll be interdisciplinary, I should say. So not just for mathematics, and um, statistics, but also for biology, chemistry, social sciences. If you're interested, please feel free to go to MAA's website to fill out an application um, to attend this workshop. It's going to have tools, resources, best practices for uh, faculty who want to implement data science projects into their curriculum. So um, anyone that is, interested, that is interested, please feel free to uh, visit our website to, to apply for that workshop. We might uh, put a link in the chat just so that you can get there. But really excited about that and all the uh, upcoming fun things we have around data science from MAA. Yeah, thanks, Kiara. And you know, just to underscore, this is PicMath is a program we've had for a lot of years. But this is the, uh, the first time, I believe, that we're having these um, sort of interdisciplinary science math teams for, for this data science workshop. So yeah, I encourage you to, to check that out. Yeah. All right, well, we are um, just closing in on the top of the hour, so um, we can start with the program itself in, in just a minute here. I want to welcome everyone again, who, um, if you're joining us for tonight's um, virtual distinguished lecture. Um, I am delighted to, um, to have you here for the, for the featured event tonight. Um, I want to highlight again that the, the chat is available on both YouTube and Facebook, so feel free to use that as a venue for um, questions or to respond to uh, points that the speaker ma has made. Um, we will have time at the end of the presentation for Q&A with our speaker, Nathan Carter. So um, you can plop your questions in at any point or save them for the end when we will engage with uh, Dr. Carter in that way. So, and with that, I will invite the MAA Executive Director, uh, Dr. Michael Pearson, to join us to introduce the speaker for tonight. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, dear Dre. It's great Thank to be here with everybody. Looking forward to it. And hello, Nathan. Great to have you here. Yeah, thank you. So, um, you know, Nathan and I have been talking, oh, 
a little on and off, but keeping connections going up on this topic for uh, mm -hmm. quite a while now. And a couple of years, uh, as Kira mentioned, we've got some work happening in data science and Nathan's very much involved with that. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say about it tonight. So by way of introduction, Dr. Carter works in the interplay between mathematics and computer science and particularly mathematical visualization and data science. He recently was the lead editor for Data Science for Mathematicians, which was published by Taylor and Francis in 2020. Nathan is currently serving as Wilder Teaching Professor at Bentley University in Waltham, Massachusetts, which is near Boston. And I want to note that this is a prestigious name chair devoted to support of teaching where Nathan works across the disciplines at, at uh, um, Bentley to, to advance the uh, quality of teaching, uh, particularly in STEM. So that's, that's really a, a great, great thing. Nathan has received the Bentley uh, Innovation in Teaching Award three times, most recently in 2016. In 2010, the MAA recognized Nathan's teaching excellence with the Alder Award. And also in 2021, Nathan received the MAA's Beckenbach Book Prize for his introduction to the mathematics of computer graphics, which the MAA published in 2016. So Nathan's been racking up the accolades over the years and we're proud to have him on uh, let, I'll say you're on our team, Nathan. Yeah. Now, I, I did uh, try to try to get some dirt, try to find some anecdotes, you know, some little story about you. I, I called up Rick Cleary to see, you know, what little anecdotes I could get. Man, you must uh, uh, have threatened him not to say anything. He didn't give you up. So, uh <laughs> But uh, Nathan, it, seriously, it's really great to have you here and I'm looking forward to your talk and I will turn it over to you to do just that. All right, great. Thank you very much, Michael. I, I was gonna say, if you had found some dirt, I would have been disappointed. There, there's, I was not told in advance there was gonna be hazing before the talk. So I, I'm glad you did not find anything. Thank you. <laughs> All right, great. So I'm very excited to be able to talk to you about mathematics and data science. Um, Michael mentioned uh, that I worked with a team of people on a book called Data Science for Mathematicians, but you might call this talk more uh, Data Science for Math Students. I'm thinking that there's probably some undergraduate students in the audience, and uh, maybe you're majoring in math and you're thinking, I'm looking at a lot of the jobs out there and I'm seeing that they all seem to have data in the title, or a lot of them do. Is that what I have to do after I graduate? It seems that's what a lot of people are doing. Uh, so to help you think about that, I wanna just tell you where does math show up in data science? Uh, where does the math that perhaps you've gotten to love in your math education, uh, where does that show up in data science so that you can you know, know what data science is all about from a math point of view? So let's get into it. Uh, I wanna first, of course, start with saying what is data science so we know what we're talking about. And I've got a little definition here that's got uh, three parts. So if you're using math or stats powered by modern computing tools to answer some real world question, uh, then you're probably doing data science. So it has to have those three parts. And the data scientist has to have a little bit of expertise in at least each of those three things. Uh, so let's look at some examples. I'll put, I'll put this definition sort of as a little equation on the top of the next slide. Data science is those three things added together. And uh, if we look at these four questions here, they're from different areas of human interest, and each of them can be a data science question. So let's see how that is. If we look at the first question on the list, uh, do the US government's records of mortgage applications reveal any patterns of discrimination? All right, now let's think how each piece of the definition relates to that question. So why would a data scientist need to know some math and stats if they wanted to attack that question? Uh, well, if you're looking at the data, you might say, hey, this pattern looks like that might be discrimination. Is that a real pattern or a coincidence? And math and stats have the tools to tell real patterns from coincidences. So that's why math and stats is valuable. How about computing tools? Why would that be needed? Uh, well, this government database that I'm talking about and that some of my students have looked at, uh, each year it has about 15 million entries, so you definitely need some computing power to look into that database. Uh, and then why would you need to know something about the application domain, uh, in this case mortgages, uh, in order to answer the question? Well, the database has terms in it like 
rate spread and loan prospector and subordinate lien. And if we don't know what those things are, we can't even use that data. So the data scientist also needs some knowledge of the application domain or somebody they can go to ask questions about the application domain. Uh, now, these other questions we're not going to go into in as much detail, but I put the sports one up there because I remember talking about that with my brother who's into fantasy league baseball. Uh, I put the business one up there because I have a friend who just went into a startup, uh, and the purpose of that startup is to answer that question for their clients. Uh, and I put the public health one up there because we're going to actually look at that during the course of this talk. And here's the outline we're going to follow. Uh, we're going to break this into three parts, sort of uh, in increasing order of difficulty. Uh, we're going to start with the basic things that people do with data, called I'm calling that section working with data, and we're going to fill in those empty bullet points with what math shows up there. And we'll see a lot of basic mathematics that you can run into in a high school math education shows up whenever you're doing any of the most basic operations of working with data. Uh, then we're going to go one level higher and say, what about when I'm sort of being strategic and putting those steps together into an analysis that, ha that, analysis that has some you know, rational flow to it, trying to answer a question, what math shows up there? And we'll make a list, and that'll be uh, some more higher level math that shows up in uh, most undergraduate students' college math education. Uh, and then at the end, we'll sort of uh, see what people are doing on the frontiers of the field and see what math shows up as we try to attack uh, some unsolved problems. So that's the outline. And... Uh, I want to begin by looking at the, uh, the first section I talked about, the basic steps of working with data. And to do that, let's make it concrete by bringing up an actual table of data. Since I know nobody out there is sick of COVID, we'll talk about some vaccination data. Uh, so if you have access to the chat, go ahead and uh, put in the chat anything you want to say about the table of data that I've put on the screen. You could ask a question, you can make an observation, you can have an insight, whatever you want. Go ahead and type it into the chat. And uh, while you do that, I'll mention that uh, if this were an, if we were going to do an actual data project with uh, this data set, we would need to know uh, what each one of these columns uh, means. We would need to know how this data was collected. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we would get very specific about. But for the purpose of this talk, we're just going to you know take it as it is and be sort of informal. All right, so let's see what uh, what kind of thoughts people have put into the chat. All right, everybody's being shy. That's okay. I suspect one of the questions that's in your mind is. What does NAN mean? Why is that in there? These are supposed to be numbers. Uh, what's that all about? So the, uh, the software tool I was using uh, uses the uh, NAN to mean not a number, or uh, we don't have a number to put in that cell of the table. There's some missing values. Uh, and that's actually one thing that, uh, you know, whenever you're working with, uh, with data, there may be missing values, and that's an important thing to think about. And we'll see that show up in a moment. All right, so let's think about uh, what are the most common things you'd want to do with just about any data like this in a data project. Well, the very first thing we'd probably want to do, the absolute simplest thing you can do with data, is look up something in the table. Right now, if this was a table you could print out, you'd just look at the table and use your finger and find the answer you wanted. Um, but if I want to answer a question like the one on the slide with a table of data this big, uh, I'm going to use a computer to do it because there's thousands and thousands of rows in this table. So if I wanted to ask, you know, how many people per hundred were vaccinated in a certain state on a certain date? Uh, you know, the idea is we'd be looking down that those first two columns to find the date and state and then go over to the people vaccinated per 100 column until we found the number we're looking for. And uh, I was doing this uh, data analysis in Python because lots of data scientists use Python. Uh, it doesn't really matter what software you, you're using, but if I were going to do that lookup, I would probably write one line of Python code that would look up that value. But as soon as I write a line of code that can look that up, then anybody could come along and change Alabama to some other state and change the date to a different date. and so. Once I've automated something, I really haven't just looked up one value. I've actually created what in math we call a function to look up values. Right? A function is something that takes inputs and gives you the corresponding output. And as soon as I have, you know, begin to think of this as a function, then various questions show up. Like, first of all, is it even really a function? Does it pass the vertical line test? Uh, which in this case would mean, uh, did any state ever report the numbers twice on the same day? Uh, so if I were to look up the date in the state, I'd get more than one number. And I'd wonder, which one of these things is the actual output? Uh, or does it matter if I look up a state in the date and I get NAN as the output? Does it matter if a value is missing? And uh, what dates and states am I allowed to plug into that function? So even with just this simplest thing we want to do with data, just look up a number, we've got all these questions arising. And they're all actually math questions. If you think about, you know, the difference between a function and a relation, like does it pass the vertical line test, and, and what is a function, and functions can take more than one input. And, and when we think about uh, what I'm allowed to plug into the function, that's the domain, and what I might get out, that's the range. So all these really basic things that you talk about, even in a high school algebra class, show up 
in the simplest operation of working with data, just looking up a value. Okay, how about something a little more interesting than just looking up a value? How about making a data visualization? So I might have a question like, how has the vaccine distribution gone in my state? My state's Massachusetts, so here's the picture for Massachusetts. Uh, this data spanned uh, most of the months in 2021, so there's actually, you could extend this a little further now, um, but this is 2021 data. Now, I made this picture because uh, time is you know, an independent variable and then the vaccinations are dependent on that, so it made sense to sort of graph it kind of looking like a curve. Uh, it's not really a curve, it's a lot of little points that look like a curve, um, but this is a good way to graph it because of the kind of data I had. If I'd had a different kind of data, I would have needed to make a different kind of picture. Uh, for example, here's a couple of different uh, common types of data you might run into and the ways that we typically visualize them. You know, for example, if I had had a function that took pairs of numbers as inputs and gave me a single number as output, I might graph it as a surface in space instead. Or if I had had a set of numbers, not pairs, I might have graphed it as a histogram to see the distribution. So being able to identify what kind of data I've got is important if I'm going to be able to make a picture of it. So I have a friend who calls this uh, mathematical zoology, right? Because the biologists love to sort of classify plants and animals into this taxonomy. Well, as mathematicians, we can do that too. There's lots of different mathematical objects and we have names for them. And that's useful in knowing what kind of data I've got and what I can do with it, including visualization. So let's go ahead and put that stuff on our list too. Knowing things like you know famous sets of numbers like reals and integers, uh, knowing things like sets and subsets and you know ordered pairs and all these common mathematical objects, uh, that's really useful for knowing what kind of data I have. Okay, so there's some more math, basic math that shows up in data science. Uh, now let's look at something that's one step more complicated. Uh, what about doing prediction with data? What if I wanted to say, okay, I'm curious where this data is going, right? If I'm you know it's the end of 2021 and I'm asking. Well, how many vaccines does it look like we're going to give out in Massachusetts in the future? Uh, that's basically a question about whether this curve has a horizontal asymptote to the right, right? If you want to speak in algebra terms, or if you've had a calculus class, you might think, what's the limit as time goes to the right? Um, but actually, when we think about uh, horizontal asymptotes or limits, those are things we talk about for functions. I don't actually have a function here. I just have a lot of little points. I just have data. So what I really want to do is I want to make a function that behaves like this data so that I can ask those asymptote or limit questions about it. Okay, well, if I want to make a function that behaves like the data, I need to know what kind of functions you know, there are out there so I can pick one that looks like this data. All right, well, let's look at some famous families of functions and see if any of these apply. Uh, probably everybody out there has seen the linear family of functions since uh, you know, way back in whatever, Algebra 1, whenever you had that. Uh, if you change M and B, you get different members of the family. Uh, that family of functions is good for situations where there's a constant ratio throughout the whole situation, throughout the whole situation, because the line has the same slope all the time. Uh, if instead you needed to deal with, you know, maybe an object falling under the influence of gravity, you'd go to the quadratic family, and different values of A, B, and C give you different parabolas. Uh, if you were working with things that compound over time, like money or population, you'd go to the exponential family. Um, but now I've got this logistic family here, and that actually kind of looks a little bit maybe like our data because it has a plateau at the end. Uh, what is that family good for? Well, that family of functions is good for rolling out a new product, describing a product rollout. So, uh, and here I'm talking about, uh, not about a product like um, mac and cheese, where you buy some mac and cheese and you eat the mac and cheese and you're like, man, I just want to go buy more mac and cheese. Uh, no, I'm talking here about products you just buy one of. Like uh, maybe uh, you only need one Twitter account, or you only need one yacht. I only need one yacht. Probably you do too. So in this, in that case, if you look at the uh, the, the curve here, as time goes on, uh, the, on the left side of the time axis, we have before the product is released, the y value is near zero. We haven't sold any. Uh, then when we release the product, then people start to buy them, and the curve picks up. And eventually, we're selling them pretty quickly. But then pretty soon. Everybody that wants one has one, and we plateau off, and we're not selling anymore, right? Okay, so that curve is actually kind of reasonable. Maybe that's going to fit our vaccination situation, because once you get a couple shots, you don't need any more. So um, let's take a look, actually, before we apply this to that situation. Let's see what the various parameters in here, the H, M, and B, let's see what they mean. Well, the M and the B actually behave a lot like they do in uh, the straight line situation. The M is kind of like the slope, and the B is kind of like the y-intercept. Uh, but the H has a separate meaning. It's the height of that eventual plateau. 
Okay, so that's actually the number we're gonna care about in the vaccine situation. All right, now when I come back to my data and I've got this tool at my disposal, the logistic curve, I should actually be a little bit worried because, well, my data kind of looks like a logistic curve for like most of it, but then as soon as you get up to like October, November, all of a sudden it spikes up again. And so if you have access to the chat, uh, don't be shy this time, go ahead and type into the chat, what is the cause of that spike starting in November? Why did the data just leap up starting in November? Um, so while you do that, I'm gonna go ahead and try anyway to fit the logistic curve to this data. I'm gonna ask my computer to find the ideal values of H, M, and B that would make the curve uh, line up, hug the data as much as possible. When I do that, we get uh, these values of H, M, and B in, in that formula there. And you see it like kind of worked and it kind of didn't, right? Like the, on the left-hand side, it fits pretty well, but on the right-hand side, well, we, we kind of expected this was gonna happen. The red curve plateaued because that's what the logistic curve does and the data spiked up. So that didn't work so well. Our model was too simple. All right, so let's see what folks are saying in the chat. Um, oh yeah, people are saying things like booster shots. Very good, yeah. Uh, that, that is definitely one of the things that came about. Oh, somebody just said vaccines approved for children. Right, okay. So what we have here is actually in the beginning of the year, all the adults got their first shots. And then starting there at the end of the year, the boosters and the kids started to get their shots. So that's why it spikes up again. So we don't have one product rollout here. We have two product rollouts happening. So we should make sure our math describes that. So let's go ahead and add up two logistic curves, right? One for the first product rollout and one for the second one, which is kind of like the kids and the boosters together. If we do that, it works much better. In fact, it's almost difficult to distinguish the model from the data because they're right on top of each other. Great, so now I have a function that really does behave like my data, so I can go ahead and ask the question I wanted to ask in the first place, which is, does it have a horizontal asymptote? Does it taper off? And I'm gonna use uh, calculus notation here, but if you've just had uh, algebra instead, you can just ignore where it says lim there. We're asking about a horizontal asymptote, and it makes sense that uh, it's the sum of the two heights of the two plateaus, the one for the first product rollout and the one for the second. In this case, it projects about 16.5 million shots are gonna be given out in Massachusetts. All right, well, that was a bit of a more fun exercise, a little more complicated than the ones that came before. But what math, what math showed up there? Well, we saw that uh, we needed to recognize that it was an asymptote or limit question. Uh, we needed to then say, oh, well, I need a function that behaves like this data. What functions are available to me? So we needed to know some famous families of functions. And uh, then when none of those worked, we needed to realize that we could stack up two copies of the logistic curve by adding them together, right? So that was an algebraic transformation we could do to build a function we needed. Okay, great. So what we've seen so far is that the basic operations of working with data uh, involve these kinds of math. And the good news is all of that math shows up in a good high school math education. So if you've had a high school math education, you have the foundations of being able to work with uh, data. Awesome. All right, but what about the people out there that I said I was uh, sort of aiming this talk at in the first place, people that are maybe undergraduate math majors. If you've learned more math than just your high school math education, what more can you do? So that moves us on to the next section where I wanna talk about what it's like to do an analysis, to put together these sort of little steps we just looked at into a sequence to answer a bigger question. All right, and so uh, what I mean by doing an analysis is what I just said, let me give you an example. Here's a, here's a project that my students did a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and if some of my students are here and it's, this doesn't look exactly like the project you did, that's because I did different versions in different semesters. Uh, so the question was, are vaccination rates in a state related to the state's politics? I hope nobody uh, starts getting mad at anybody else in the chat because I said politics. But uh, so here's what my students did. They said uh, they loaded the vaccination data that we just looked at. And they also loaded some voting data about each of the 50 states. They then uh, did the exact same prediction we just did to see where does the data seem to be going, but they did it not just for Massachusetts, but for every one of the 50 states, and they got those 50 numbers. And then they checked to see if there was any correlation between that and the voting numbers. Right? And then they didn't wanna just see if a correlation looked like it happened, they wanted to formalize that, so they did a hypothesis test, then they wrote a report to say what they found, and they included some appropriate visualizations in their report to help the reader know what was going on. All right, so that's an example of what I mean by an analysis, right? It tells a story about the data, it has a logical flow, it answers a question, and uh, there's a name for this sort of thing. 
it's called a computational narrative, right? You're telling a story with data. Uh, so I've got a screenshot here, and I know the font is tiny. You don't have to be able to, uh, you don't have to be able to read that. This is a screenshot of a piece of software that's useful when you're writing a computational narrative. Uh, this piece of software is really commonly used in data science. It's called Jupyter. Um, but if you've never heard of Jupyter before, that's fine. You've probably used very similar software. If you have used any of the most common math software, uh, Maple or Sage or Mathematica or Maple, all of those give you a similar user interface. Uh, they call it a notebook style interface. It lets you write a document that has lots of different kinds of things in it, uh, whatever you need to tell your story about the computations you're doing. Uh, so for example here, even though we can't, uh, even though we don't need to zoom in, we can see that uh, we're allowed to put in headings uh, to sort of break our document up into logical sections. We're allowed to put tables so we can see our data. Uh, we're allowed to write math formulas if we want to describe an equation we're using. Uh, we're allowed to write code that's going to actually be run in the document and do something. Uh, maybe it outputs like a graph that we would want to see. And uh, we can see other types of data visualizations. And most importantly, uh, we can write text because we want to be able to describe our computation, sort of put our logical reasoning in there so the reader knows what's going on. That's why it's called a computational narrative. All right, now why do I bring these up? Well, I bring them up because the main thing I want to uh, get across about these is that computational narratives are actually a lot like proofs. So if you've had a college math education, you've taken some more advanced classes, and you're thinking, what can I do with this stuff? Well, any of those classes you took that involve proofs uh, prepare you very well for doing computational narratives. There's a lot of things in common between the two. And so to, to make that a little more concrete, let me pull out just a little piece from a computational narrative, and let's look at it together. So here's one step from that computational narrative about vaccines. Uh, it says, it asks the question, uh, you know, what time frame does the data cover? Then there's a single line of Python code. And if you don't speak Python, I'll just tell you what that means. It lifts the first and last entries from the date column. Okay. And then the text afterwards says, oh yeah, so we did that and here are the dates we found. Now, there's a couple of things to notice that are in common between computational narratives and proofs. Uh, first of all, the goal in both cases is always to figure out what's true. That's the goal. And on the way to figuring out what's true, uh, we're going to be assembling evidence. And as we assemble that evidence, we're probably going to need to get into some technical details. And in a proof, those technical details are usually various kinds of math, whereas in a computational narrative, they're usually code. Um, but uh, similar skills apply. And in each case, there is a... Uh, <clears throat> There's certain kinds of deductions you're allowed to do and certain kinds of deductions you're not allowed to do. So there's a lot of similarities there. And uh, in fact, when we get into that question of am I allowed to take this step of reasoning or am I not, uh, you, might, uh, you might bring in and uh, bring to bear the skepticism and checking of assumptions that you learned uh, when doing proofs. And in fact, in this case right here, when we look at this step of work, we'd say, was this the right thing to do? Uh, in fact, when we think back to the data that we saw, the table of data we saw was sorted not by dates, but it was sorted by states. So maybe taking the first and last entries in the column was actually a bad idea. So that skepticism and sort of questioning of your assumptions from proofs comes over to help you also question assumptions in your computational narratives and make sure you're doing the right kinds of deduction there as well. And also, the way that you would fill in the gaps in your reasoning and, and sort of plug those holes uh, also transfers over well from doing proofs. Uh, if you found a gap in a proof you were working on, you'd probably go check the official definition in the textbook or go look up some theorems in your notes you might use. And you can do a similar thing here. I could go check the official software documentation for the tools I'm using to see if there's anything they could, you know, that I could bring to bear on solving this problem. And I might find that, uh, Sorry, I got too many buttons in front of me. Sometimes I'm looking at the wrong thing. Uh, I might find that there is a tool in there for doing, taking the minimum and maximum of a column of dates, and that's guaranteed to give me the earliest and the latest. So I could fix my mistake that way. All right, so what have we learned? We've seen that uh, having skepticism and questioning your assumptions is a skill that you learn when doing proofs, and that comes over really well to, uh, to doing, uh, writing computational narratives. And also, uh, that using official definitions is something that we often, in you know, checking the uh, the official source of the theorems is something we do to fill in holes in our proofs, and that works out uh, to be a really good skill for filling in gaps in our computational narratives as well. And it's not just the fact that like I like math, I like to teach math, that I say, oh yeah, you should always check your assumptions. Uh, I want to prove that to you. I want to show you here a 
screenshot of a website from a company called Superconductive, and they put out a product called Great Expectations. And the way that product works is it lets a data scientist state the expectations they have for a data set, and then the software will watch to see if those expectations, that is, those assumptions, stay true over time. And if they don't, it will notify the data scientist right away so that they don't draw conclusions or deliver a product to a customer that's wrong. So it's not just like, oh yeah, math professors like to say you should always check your assumptions. No, even more than that, there are people out there who are making money checking assumptions. So it's a very valuable thing to do. Okay. So the next thing that, that I also want to show you some more connections between proofs and computational narratives, but I need an example proof in order to do that. You don't have to read the proof if you don't want to. I mean, you can if you want to. If you really like reading proofs, go right ahead. Um, but if you have not had a class that involved proofs like this one, uh, that's okay. You can just think back to your high school geometry class and imagine this is a proof about shapes instead. We're not going to get into the details of it. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to imagine uh, that you were in a class where your instructor had given you this proof to do for homework. They had said, prove to me that every prime number bigger than three is adjacent to a multiple of six. All right, so then now I want you to imagine that you were halfway done doing that homework assignment. Okay, so maybe you were here at point A, you'd written the first paragraph, and you uh, and were thinking, oh, now what do I do next? All right, so what are the kinds of things that come to mind? Well, you probably want to think, uh, is my instructor going to buy all the stuff I've written so far? Is this right? And you probably want to think, well, based on that stuff, what am I allowed to say next? And you know, questions like that come to mind. And then when you get down further and you're at point B, very similar things come to mind, but you've said more stuff, so you have more to build on. right? So you care about what your reader will accept and what they know based on what you've said at each point in a proof. Right? That's something you're very familiar with if you've written proofs. And a really similar thing happens when you're writing a computational narrative. Both of them are these iterative constructions of knowledge that build on earlier stuff and increase knowledge over time. But the difference is with the computational narrative, you're talking to a computer. So you care not about the reader's knowledge, but what's in the computer's memory. For example, when I go back to that same step from the computational narrative I had before, uh, I can't do that unless at point A, the computer has in its memory a table of data that's got a column called date. Right? I, otherwise, I can't take that step there where I look up the minimum and maximum. And then afterwards, I know, now I know more stuff. I can build on knowing those earliest and latest dates going forward. All right, so it's a really similar idea, this iterative construction of knowledge that increases over time. Um, furthermore, uh, you don't typically just care about writing a proof that's correct, even though that's great. If you write a proof that's correct, you often want to just turn that in and be done. Um, but once you've written a proof that's correct, you can say, yeah, but I'd like to write a proof that's really good. And so you might say, well, I care not just about like, does the reader look at it and say, yep, that's right. I want them to have a smooth reading experience. I want to be considerate of the reader. So I might stick in sentences like this. Like rather than just jump into case one and case two, you'd say, oh, look, we're going to consider each case separately. You kind of warn them what's coming so that they go, oh, I understand what's going on here. And then when you're all done, you say, see, we finished the two cases. So now we're done. It's just a way to be considerate, make the ex reading experience smooth. And we do the same thing in computational narratives. We put text before and after the computations we're doing to care about, does the reader have an intuition for what's going on? Do they feel comfortable reading what I'm saying here? So you know, you could just write a computational narrative that was all code and output, but that would be super confusing. Instead, we put in the text to let the reader know what's going on. All right. So there, these skills also transfer over well from proof writing to computational narrative writing. Uh, thinking of these things as iterative constructions of knowledge that grow with time, and thinking about how I can supply intuition to the person reading my work so that they can follow my reasoning. All right, now before we move on from this section to the final part of the talk, I want to tell you why this stuff is so important, why uh, this sort of, you know, thinking carefully about your assumptions and all that really matters. So let's take a look at uh, a situation where this went really wrong and where a company should have thought a lot more carefully about the assumptions underlying the product they were building. So the company I'm talking about is Google, and here's a Google search, and Google makes most of their money by putting ads at the top of searches like I've put in that red box there, right? So where do those ads come from? Well, there's two answers to that question that are important for us here. First of all, the advertiser gets to pick where their ads go. Like uh, if I'm advertising orange juice, I'd probably say, hey, Google, please put that in the, uh, you know, breakfast cereal searches or the uh, bagel searches or something, because that's where you'd want to hear about orange juice. Uh, and so that makes sense. The advertiser gets to pick. But then Google has lots of ads that might want to show up in a web search. 
how does it prioritize the three that get shown? Well, that depends on uh, what people have clicked on before. So if lots of people click on an ad, then Google prioritizes that more highly for future web searches. And if nobody clicks on it, it gets prioritized lower. And that kind of makes sense, right? Like if other people clicked on it, didn't click on it, I probably don't want to see it. That, that makes sense. Until we state that assumption more formally and look at it a little more skeptically. So this is actually, by the way, no longer the way Google searches work. This is how they worked eight or 10 years ago. Google changes this all the time. Um, but at that time, if you had formalized that assumption, you might say that Google was stating this. They were saying, if we let the behavior of the people on our site and you know the way they click uh, determine which ads should show up for everybody on the site, that's going to be fine. That's a good idea. Now, that should strike you as a pretty bold assumption because it's assumption about it's an assumption about literally billions of web searches. That's a pretty broad assumption. Uh, it's an assumption about human behavior and human expectations, which are really complicated things to make assumptions about. So you should be doubtful about an assumption like this. And in fact, this did go wrong. And the way it went wrong, uh, I learned about by reading uh, this book on the left, which is written by a friend of mine named Noah, whose op office is right across the hallway from mine at Bentley. I read this book over winter break. It was really good. I recommend it. Uh, and in there, I heard a story about the paper you see on the right, which is written by Latanya Sweeney of Harvard University. And here's what uh, Latanya discovered about eight years ago. If you searched for a person's name, if you did a web search for a person's name, uh, then the ads you saw at the top of the search were much more likely to be advertisements for you to look up that person's criminal background record if the name you searched for sounded black rather than white. Now, it should be totally obvious, but I'm going to say it anyway. That's really horrible and harmful. But why did that happen? Well, the reason it happened is because the assumption on the previous slide was wrong, right? If we let everybody in the world and their clicks determine how Google searches should behave, then any biases or prejudices out there in the world are going to be learned by that algorithm and parroted back to the people that do Google searches. Not just to the people who have those biases and prejudices, but everybody. Latanya Sweeney searched up her own name, and it suggested she should do a criminal background record check on herself. So the reason I bring this example up is to say, that I'm not just telling you that you really should question the assumptions underlying your you know, data work uh, because that'll help you get a job. I'm saying you should really question the assumption, assumptions under your data work because that can be a way that you can really do good for society, that you can prevent harm in the world if you think carefully about these assumptions in products that are being built. OK. So we've now finished the first two sections of this talk, and we're at an important transition point. Uh, I want to say that the day-to-day -day work of most data scientists is made up of the things that we just talked about, right? those two sections. We're about to transition into the unsolved problems. This is something that like a very small fraction of people who work in data science work in this area. We're definitely going to use some more complicated math as we get into this section. Uh, and if you look at this stuff and you go, oh, that's totally not for me. I'm not really interested in that. That seemed like overly complicated. That's OK. You could still go into data work, because this is not the stuff that most data scientists work on. Um, but I wanted to introduce this stuff, because it's really interesting to see what's on the cutting edge. This is sort of like um, uh, a news report from the frontiers, uh, if you're into really nerdy news, I guess. And I'm the reporter here. I'm not the you know researcher who discovers this stuff. stuff. I'm just the news reporter that wants to tell you about it. Um, but I did want to get that uh, caveat out there so you don't you know, get turned off by how complicated the math at the end of the talk is and think data science isn't for you. That's definitely not true. OK, so let's get into it. Let's take a look at uh, two unsolved problems in data science. And both of them fall into the area of neural networks, which is a really hot topic. Uh, so before we dive into this, let's see what a neural network is. OK, so neural networks are modeled after actual neurons and actual brains. Uh, and here's how they're modeled uh, after actual neurons. If you, uh, a an, an, an neuron receives input signals that are electrical signals, and if they add up to above a certain threshold, then it passes that signal along to later neurons in the network. Now, we're going to model that mathematically like this. Uh, we'll get some real numbers coming in as inputs, and I've written them on the slide here as x1, x2, x3, but there could be any number of them. It doesn't have to be three. Uh, they'll come into the neuron, and we'll add them all up. 
And if they pass a certain threshold, then we'll pass on some signal as our output y. And if not, then we'll just pass on y equals zero instead to mean no signal. To help us with that, we're going to bring back our old friend, the logistic function, I think. There we go. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we'll bring in that x1, x2, x3. We'll add them all up, and then we'll plug them into the logistic curve. And you notice that if we plug in a value that's really small on the left side of the x-axis, then y will be close to 0, and that'll be no signal we pass on. Uh, but we've chosen here a logistic curve of height 1. So if we uh, plug in an x value that's on the high end of the axis, then we'll get a y value that's close to 1, and that means we are passing on a signal. Great. Uh, but I'm going to make one modification here. I'm going to split this process into two halves. We're going to take that exponent, the mx plus b, and we're going to lift that out and do that first. All right, that's I've highlighted that in red. And then the rest of the logistic function, the blue part, we're going to do as a second step. And the reason I've split it into two parts here is because then we can actually take that mx plus b transformation and we can do it separately to each input. So we'll use a different m and b for each input. Why? Well, because we want neural networks to be really flexible and useful for just about any uh, situation we might want to apply them to. So I have no idea what these x1, x2, x3 are. They could be all different units of measure. They could be all different levels of importance. And we want the neural network to be flexible enough to rescale those to whatever relative sizes they ought to have. All right. So we're going to give a different mx plus b transformation to each input to permit that. We're still going to add all those up. I'm calling the sum s. And we'll plug that into our logistic function. And that'll be our output. Uh, this really simplified logistic function you see in blue uh, is sometimes called a sigmoid. So if you hear neural network people talk about that function, uh, they're just referring to that simplified version of the logistic curve. OK, so that's the model of one neuron. It's got this two-step process where you do mx plus b to each input and add them all up, then plug them into the logistic curve to get your output. To make a network out of these neurons, we just put a whole bunch of them together, connect it in any way we like, like this. Uh, we might take an x value in on the left, put it through the six neurons you see there, and then get a y value out on the right. And the reason I've shown each uh, neuron is like a little pill shape with two halves is just to remind us that it is a two-step process. We collect all the inputs and add them up, and then we plug them into the logistic curve to get the output that we pass on. And every single line in that diagram have, has its own mx plus b transformation applied to it. So there's a lot of parameters in here, lots of m's and b's that let you uh, customize this function to be very, you know, uh, take a lot of different, well, I should say, customize this network to represent a lot of different functions. Uh, we say that this network has three layers, or has depth three. And it, because there are two neurons in each layer, we say it has width two. But uh, we don't have to keep our networks this small. We can make bigger ones. Here's a neural network with five layers, each of them with five neurons. And every layer has every neuron connected to every neuron in the next layer. Uh, we say that means this network is fully connected or dense. Uh, but as soon as we start to draw pictures this busy, we're like, yeah, that's too much to draw. Let's just write it like this instead. It's a 5 by 5 grid, fully connected. Then we don't have to draw that picture, and everybody knows what's going on. OK, so I've said a couple of times so far that neural networks are really flexible. So let me show you what I mean. If you think back to the first family of function we, functions we looked at, the linear family, they're all lines. There's not a lot of variety there. And then the second family was all parabolas, not a lot of variety. So now let's look at some example functions from this family right here, the functions you could make by using a network of that shape. When we graph them, we get lots of different shapes. Right here are just six examples from this infinite family. And you see they're not at all all the same thing. They're very different from one another. So that's what I mean when I say that neural networks are really flexible. Also, we don't have to just take in uh, one input and give one output. We could build a network that takes in any number of inputs and gives any number of outputs. Uh, let's just say two inputs and one output so that we could graph them like surfaces in space. And we can see, OK, well, what would that be like? And I've upgraded us here to a 15 by 15 network to make it a little more complex, a little more rich. And we see that we get surfaces like this. See, they're really wavy, really flexible, lots of different shapes they can take on. Here's two more from the same family. OK, so neural networks can make functions with lots of different shapes that are pretty intricate. Great, what do we use them for? Well, because they're so flexible, you can use them for lots of things. Uh, but I want to just show you the one application that they are most famous for. And that is recognizing patterns in images. Now, probably you have somebody in your life who, uh, like a few people in my life, is really old school and occasionally gives you a handwritten check that that's how they pay you. Uh, so it, I know. 
Venmo is better, but there are still those folks occasionally that give you a handwritten check. And in that case, you go to your ATM and you slide it in, and the ATM is smart. It looks at it and it says, oh, this is a check for $37.12. Do you want to deposit it? So somewhere in that ATM is this algorithm that can take little pictures of the digits that somebody wrote on that check and recognize what they are. Now that seems like a hard algorithm to write, but we're going to see that neural networks actually make it easy. Uh, there's a famous data set out there called the, uh, that's put out by the National Institute for Standards and Technology, and it's a whole bunch of little photographs of digits like that uh, and their corresponding, the integer that's actually drawn in them, so that if you were going to make an algorithm like this, you can use it for testing your algorithm and seeing if it's any good. Uh, and those images are 28 by 28 little photographs, uh, little grayscale images. So this algorithm we're trying to think about is actually, it takes 784 inputs, right? That's 28 times 28 pixels, and it's supposed to produce one output, the number that's drawn in there. That seems like a challenging algorithm to invent. Um, but like I said, neural networks make it easy, and here's how. You take those 784 inputs, and you line all of them up as the inputs to the network, right? So the, here they are on the left side of the screen, one giant column, X number one through X 784. And then on the right-hand side, you'd expect there to be one output, just one integer Y. Um, but it turns out that uh, some clever folks have decided that it works better if we instead uh, compute the probabilities of each different digit and just pick the biggest one. We don't need to worry about those details. The question is, what do we put in between? And the answer is, all you have to do is put in between one single layer of just 32 neurons and connect everything uh, densely. And then you hand this network the data set that the National Institute of Standards and Technology provided of all those little photographs, and you ask your computer to optimize the parameters in this network, all the M's and B's, to learn from that data set. And literally in one or two minutes, your computer could do that and develop a network that with 95% accuracy or better can tell you what, the, uh, little, what any little photograph of a digit represents even if it's a photograph that, the, uh, that was not in your original data set. So that's pretty amazing that in, you know, any one of us could do this as an exercise this afternoon. There's tutorials, all, well, not this afternoon. Depending on where you are, it might be late at night. But uh, there are tutorials all over the internet for how you can do this in very short order. So that's pretty impressive that neural networks can do that. But they can do lots more things than that. Uh, you know, here is a larger neural network. This is the general overall scheme of the network uh, that was published by Karen and Andrew in 2014. And this one can you, uh, take color images as input, and it can detect all sorts of different objects in them, not just like cars and cats and dogs, but individual breeds of dogs. This one is large. It has 14.7 million parameters, but that is tiny. This is a network from eight years ago. They're much, much larger now. They have hundreds of billions of parameters in neural networks today. Okay, so in fact, that uh, hugeness of neural networks is what leads us to the two open problems I want to talk about. And uh, since we're running a little bit low on time, I want to give you just a short version of problem number one, and then we'll spend a little more time on problem number two. So here are some open questions. Uh, are these neural networks that we're making, are they just too big? Are they too flexible? Can anything go wrong with how large we're making these things? Uh, and then secondly, if these things have so many parameters, what do they mean? Do they actually have meanings? Uh, so let's take a look at those two things. These are pretty interesting questions from the, from the frontiers. Uh, that first question, here's how we're going to make it precise. So for a long time, anybody that works in mathematical modeling has known that you can make a mistake in mathematical modeling in one of two ways. And I see somebody earlier in the chat was saying we have to worry and be careful about overfitting. Uh, if, if you've heard that phrase before, that's exactly what we're talking about here. We already saw an example of where I started off picking a mathematical model that was too simple when I was trying to predict the vaccine data. Remember, we used one logistic curve and it plateaued too soon because it didn't take into account the fact that there were two bumps in the data. So if we think of all the different mathematical models I might have picked as uh, being on the horizontal axis and they're sorted by how complex they are, my problem is I was too far to the left. I picked a model that was too simple. And so my model would have given a high error rate in its predictions, right? That's why the curve is high on the left-hand side. Now, it might be surprising that, to hear that if you pick a mathematical model that's too complex, you can also get bad predictions or a high error rate. Um, but if that seems counterintuitive, here's a way you can think of it. Uh, imagine that, you know how in some movies there's like that person that's got 
on the wall of their apartment, they've got all these photographs and there's like yarn and thumbtacks connecting them. And they've got this bizarre theory about what's going on. And other people are coming in and trying to calm them down and convince them that that's not really right. But everything that gets said, they go, no, here's the reason. And they can work it into their bizarre theory. An overly complicated mo mathematical model is a little bit like that. It takes so many irrelevant details into account that it's going to give bad pre predictions because it's paying attention to irrelevant details. So for decades in mathematical modeling, we've known that you want to look for the sweet spot. Not too simple, not too complex. You want to find that middle of the curve where the error rate is low. I say for decades, but this changed about three and a half years ago when somebody noticed uh, that really big neural networks are the exception to this rule. And they, uh, they extended this graph out further to the right, and they looked at really large neural networks. And they saw that after they get bad, they get good again. So this is, uh, this is called double descent, because the blue curve goes down twice. And you notice when it goes down the second time, it goes down further and gets an even lower error rate in its predictions than before. So the really big neural networks out to the right behave really well. Somehow, after they get past the conspiracy theory point, they turn around to get smart again and nobody knows why that's happening. That's why it's such an interesting open question. Now, lots of people have been working on this, even though the problem is only three and a half years old, lots of people have published papers on this, a new paper comes out like every month, um, but uh, nobody has fully solved the question. Uh, people have done proofs about uh, you know, a certain category of neural networks, but not all neural networks. People have done extensive empirical studies to, to show you know, why a theory works in a lot of situations, but don't have a proof for it or that you might look at the papers and find that there's a couple of good answers, but they aren't the same answer. And you wonder, how can we unify these into a you know, consistent theory? Uh, so that's the state of affairs. I told you I was going to tell you about unsolved problems. So that's an open question. But it's really important that we, uh, you know, if we're going to use these things for anything mission critical, that, uh, that we actually know why they work and why it doesn't seem like you know, the, uh, the, actual, uh, you know, the actual real practice of using neural networks doesn't fit with our theory. That should be a little worrisome. And that's why lots of people are working on it. Okay, so that's the first question, but I want to, oh, and I forgot to say what math shows up in there. That's the whole point of the talk, right? Uh, probability and real analysis, specifically at the graduate level, are the kinds of things that are going into the proofs people are doing in those papers. Uh, but I want to spend a little more time on this second question because this one is a little bit more fun. If we have these models that are so huge, what do all their parameters mean? And let's just think back for a second to the really simple mathematical model we used for the vaccine data. Uh, in that situation with the logistic curve, we could have explained what all of its moving parts did on one slide, right? It had three moving parts, H, M, and B. And you know, H is the total number of vac vaccinations we'd expect in the long term, and M and B have similar straightforward explanations. Now, this model turned out to be too simple. We needed two of them put together, so we just would have had these three explanations twice in our mathematical model. But either way, we would have totally understood the mathematical model. It had only six moving parts, no surprises. As soon as we move up to even just this neural network from eight years ago, and we pick out one of the millions of parameters from the middle of it and say, what does that one mean? Well, how do you even begin to think about that question? But it's a really important question. Like when we think back to the Latanya Sweeney example, we remember, well, we, you know, Google built a data product, a mathematical model that did things that were bad and unexpected. How do we prevent that? We want to totally understand what this thing might do. And so, you know, we don't want to just say, yeah, we don't know. It works great. Let's just keep using it. We want to know what's going on. So again, this is an unsolved problem, so I don't have an answer. But I can show you some cool progress that people have made. Uh, and I'm going to take this slide, and I'm going to move it to the top of the screen so that we can make some notes below it. And, uh, and so I'm going to tell you about one idea that one research team had. Here's what they said. Well, we can't, we can't figure out exactly what every parameter in the network means. But there are certain clusters of neurons that go together in a specific way we're not going to talk about here. And we can find a way to interpret those. And here's how they did it. They said, uh, there's an optimization technique that, that we use when we are making these networks uh, learn from data. That optimization technique finds the best values of the parameters in the network to, to learn from the data. So let's take that same optimization technique and use it for something else. And here's what their idea was. Let's instead optimize the input image to maximally stimulate that little cluster of neurons that we want to understand. All right, so let me just say that again. We want to come up with, we're going to synthesize an input image to light up the cluster of neurons we want to interpret. And then we'll have a picture 
of what, those, uh, what that cluster of neurons means. Okay, now I'm gonna ask you the coolest question that you're gonna be asked today, for sure, hands down. Are you ready? Would you like to see a picture of the things that go on inside an artificial brain? That has got to be the coolest question you're going to be asked today. Are you ready? I'm going to hit the button. Okay, that's actually a pretty serious letdown. That's a super boring picture. But that's okay. There's a reason for that. Because I chose to look at a cluster of neurons that was really near the beginning of the network, over near the inputs. And as the layers go by, things actually increase in complexity. Later layers build on earlier layers and make more complex patterns. So let's march through the layers of the network and see what happens, okay? So uh, if we move on a little bit further, uh, here's uh, what a later cluster of neurons in the network uh, is most activated by, It's most excited by pictures like this. Uh, ignore the colors and just pay attention to the patterns of the textures. That kind of looks like leather to me, which would suggest that uh, this network, as it was learning, realized that one of the nice tools it would be good to have in its toolbox was the ability to recognize leather. So some cluster of neurons got assigned that task and learned what that looked like. And if we go a little further, we get some more complex patterns. Uh, I don't know what that one on the left looked like to you. It looks like a lot of little ropes to me. I don't know, but the one on the right is clearly leafiness, right? There's a cluster of neurons in there that's good at detecting leafiness. That's pretty interesting. Okay, now, you ready? Well, we're going to go to the final layers of the network. And I want you to use the chat in a second here. I want you to look at that picture on the left and put in the chat what that looks like to you. All right. While you do that, I'm going to go ahead and describe what the one on the right looks like to me. Uh, it looks like stacks of boxes may be seen from above at an angle or maybe reams of paper or like a flimsy apartment building. I don't know, but something rectilinear seen from above at an angle. And apparently it was important for this network to be able to detect when it was looking at a box from an angle. That was useful as one of the tools in its tool belt. Okay, so let's see what people are saying. We got a couple of different opinions there. Okay, oh yeah, a bunch of different things. People are saying things like uh, bird heads and eyes. Uh, would you like to see the actual photograph from the original data set that this network learned from that stimulates the same cluster of neurons? Here it is. Okay, that cluster of neurons is the chicken head cluster. Isn't that so interesting? And there's another cluster of neurons that is also highly activated when we look at pictures of chickens. It's the feathery bodies with spindly legs under them neuron. That is so fascinating. Let, I mean, just stop and realize that like humanity built a tiny artificial brain and it learned that chickens are a thing. That's so cool. Now, regardless of the fact that that's really cool, it doesn't actually answer the question we originally asked, which was how can we interpret the, the parameters in this network? And instead, what we have is a way that we can kind of pull back the you know, black box and look inside and say, oh, we kind of have some idea that what's going on in there is sensible and interesting, but we still just have you know, pictures of clusters of neurons and they're sort of subjective to interpret. So, the problem isn't solved, right? But at least we're peeling back the layers and making progress and seeing what's going on. Uh, if you'd like to know more about this particular project that generated these images, I got them from a blog post by Fabio Greitz, who's a data scientist. He did not invent this technique, uh, but he cites the original research paper that did. Uh, and by the way, all these slides are going to be, the MAA is going to post a link to all these slides so you can get to all these resources uh, at the end of the talk if you'd like. Um, but things like these open problems, uh, it's an exciting time to be in data science. These open problems, people make progress on them all the time. Just last month, Facebook put out a new product called Captum, which tries to assign a text description to neurons in a network. Uh, you'll still get thousands and thousands of those text descriptions for a large network, but you know, progress is being made. Nobody has totally solved these problems, but they're making progress. Uh, and of course, fitting with the theme of this talk, what kind of math did Fabio use? Uh, and what kind of math did the original research team use when they invented this technique? Well, the optimization technique that shows up everywhere in machine learning and that these folks used is called stochastic gradient descent. And it's built on two classes that just about everybody takes in their undergraduate math education. That is multivariable calculus and linear algebra. If you've had those two uh, classes, then you could understand stochastic gradient descent in five minutes. All right, so 
that finishes our tour of math and data science. But I just want to reiterate that these, uh, these unsolved problems we saw at the end, this is not what most data scientists do day to day. That's the cutting edge stuff that's done by people who are uh, you know, way more knowledgeable about this field than I am. Um, but if you, do, or if you are considering being a data scientist, the topics from the first two sections of the talk are the uh, crucial things for you to, uh, to know and love. All right, thank you very much for your attention. I would love to hear whatever your questions are. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Nathan. That was really outstanding uh, presentation. Um, so for those of you who are with us on uh, Facebook or YouTube, we are about to go into um, the Q&A session uh, virtually. So put in any uh, questions that you have or comments for Dr. Carter, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, I want to just uh, mention that, so this is our our third and final um, virtual distinguished lecture of the spring season. So the last one for this academic year, um, we do have two more uh, presentations planned for the summer and then three for the fall season as well. Um, and so, so be watching for information about that. And in particular, um, in, in June, we have a presentation by Michael Lopez, who is um, a director of football data and anal analytics uh, with the National Football League, which, you know, might be a really nice follow up to this presentation. So, um, so encourage everybody to um, stay tuned for uh, more information about those upcoming talks. But meanwhile, back to you, Nathan, um, I, you, you did a really masterful job of uh, presenting some of sort of the key components of data science and making it really uh, clear, kind of running the gamut from, you know, an understanding of sets to uh, probability and multivariable calculus and, you know, stochastic processes. So it really is showing how a, uh, the full, uh, a full range of um, mathematics uh, really serves um, a student or anyone well in understanding and doing data science. So thank you for that. Um, let's see if we have questions. Um, so um, yeah, there's a question from Cindy about advising someone with uh, a math major who is wanting to pursue a job in data science. Oh, great. Okay, so <clears throat> first of all, I would say that if you just graduated with a math major and you have a year of programming, you're actually in a great place. Um, there are probably jobs that you are qualified for in data science right away. Um, but if you want to sort of, you know, feel more comfortable in the field before you start looking for them, there are tons of uh, places online where you can get into um, sort of data competitions where they'll put out a data set with a question and they'll say, everybody just work on this for a day or two and then submit your thoughts. And you can do that and just, you know, see what kinds of things other people are doing. You can try, you know, try your hand at those things. Uh, these data competitions are really common and they're a great way to see, you know, oh, how does what I'm doing compare to what other people are doing? What can I learn from what they did? And, uh, you know, people sometimes work on teams on those things. So uh, there's a lot of ways you can, you know, get your hands on uh, some projects like that and play around for a while to get comfortable with the idea of working with data based on the great skills that it already seems like you've got based on the question here. That's great, thanks. And by the way, I'll just say that it, um, you, you, you looked at how math serves data science, but you also are the connections. But I think it all, your, your examples also made it really clear why uh, learning some data science is relevant and helpful to understanding mathematics yeah. as well. So yeah, yeah. it goes both, goes, goes both ways. Um, we had a, um, a question from Tung Chan about the role of formalization in data science. Mm. So I, uh, I'm, I guess I'm not a hundred percent sure what the question means. So I'll do my, I'll do my best to try to, to take a stab at it. And I hope I answer your question, Tung. Um, so if, uh, if the question is like trying to make the, uh, you know, the sort of individual steps in an analysis more rigorous. Um, so I think that there's a lot of things we can do to, uh, you know, to sort of make the arguments as airtight as possible. And I think it depends a lot on, uh, you know, what you're trying to accomplish. I mean, if you're just doing sort of a, a quick project to get a quick answer that, you know, estimates something to know like, oh, should we try this or not? Uh, then formalization is probably a waste of time in that situation. But if you're doing something mission critical where you really need to know that the conclusions you're drawing are, you know, something that 
you know, very important decisions are being made based on them, then I think that, uh, you know, making sure that that argument is air as airtight as possible and verifying every assumption in it in every way that you can uh, is crucial. And there are tools like that. You know, we uh, we saw one tool uh, as an example in this talk, the, uh, you know, the great expectations tool that tries to help you check your assumptions. And so if that's what you mean by formalization, um, then I think it depends a lot on what project you're doing. And in some situations, it's critical. Thank you. Um, there's another question that I'm not quite sure, maybe. Um, so from uh, Will Miles about the general rules for the number of layers and nodes within layers. Um, that right, so I'm, I'm going to um, sort of dodge this question, Will, but I'll try to give you some information anyway. Uh, so I am not an expert in neural network architectures, but I do want to make clear that in this talk, we just did like tiny versions of neural networks. We just sort of made it, made it look like they were all rectangles, uh, whereas in reality, uh, neural network architecture is a very complex thing. You can do all sorts of things that are not just rectangles. Uh, and in fact, you know, even the uh, the most complicated network that we had up there is definitely one where uh, it's not simply you know a certain number of layers and a certain number of nodes per layer. Uh, and especially when you get into language models, there are networks that loop back on themselves so that they can have a, a memory. You know, there are all sorts of levels of complexity of what people have invented. And designing the right network architecture for a problem is a really complicated question. So I'm, I'm not really answering your question, except I'm just saying there's a lot more to it than how many layers and how many nodes. Thank you so much, Nathan. Well, I think I think that's the end of the questions that I see, and we are at the end of our hour as well. So thank you once again, Nathan, for a really fascinating and engaging uh, presentation. Um, thank you. It's fun. That's great. Thank you so much, and thank you to everyone who joined us this evening.